Uh, say again, please. And no local. Oh, uh, yeah, you, you can get by without uh, having to map everything. You, you can use, you, they, they will show up as ephemeral IDs uh, locally, but that's okay. I'm not sure how to do that. I'll have to get back to you on that. Yes, so one area where our implementation is perhaps not as complete as we might like is uh, security policy stuff. So on a Windows machine, you can adjust the security policy to say who is allowed to log in locally on this, you know, who is allowed to network log on this in this machine, and there's a security descriptor there that you can adjust. So we don't have the place where that security descriptor would be stored, but it wouldn't be an unreasonable idea for somebody to, you know, give an RFE to say we'd like to have that. That actually shows up a few places. There's security descriptors on things that are not files, or they, the one most often asked for is security descriptors on the share connection points themselves. So you can separate the access control list for the top of the share, you know, the share root, separately from the sh the uh, access control, you know, the security descriptor for the share uh, entry point, the doorway. So there's essentially a, an, an app, you know, a, an SD for the doorway, separate from the SD for the for the root of the file system. Uh, that was implemented. I don't believe it's in the uh, Nexenta store product yet. That's right. And that's, it's of questionable value for a NAS because you aren't it's supposed to, yeah. I run one department at Stanford University. I depend on the campus active directory of 35,000 users. Only 500 of them are my users. I'm mm -hmm. the only one of those 500 that even bang on my cell phone. Yeah. I don't want all 35,000 to actually say, oh, you're just trying to get to, but now I can't do anything else. No. Right, but what I was going to say is that it, in, in the absence of local users, you can use those two security descriptors equivalently. The only place where you'll ever be able to see a difference is if you have a locally logged on user. And we don't, in general, have those on a NAS. So. So in the general Solaris world, we do have locally logged on users and people would like to be able to make that distinction so that local users can have greater access than what people coming in over the network can have. So, uh, you know, again, I got, I got into this one because this is, this is partly about, I'm going over time, aren't I? But I'll blame it on you guys. <laughs> um, the most common questions come up about, again, why did I get access or not get access? There are fairly good descriptions. This is, a, it's actually a com complicated routine in Windows called SE Access Check. There are variants of it actually, SE Access Check and Auto Rejection, I think it is, or something like that, which does the whole shebang of take this, access token and the security descriptor, compute granted access, and if there's no granted access, return me an error access denied, and off you go. And it's, it's a two-level nested loop that basically walks the uh, security descriptor, and the inner level walks the uh, SIDs and the token, and basically bails out if you get a deny on anything that you're asking for, and the way it actually works is it starts with the, the set of bits you've asked for, and as it walks through, if it finds something that grants any of the bits you've asked for, it knocks them out of what, what we're asking for. And if you get to the end and there are still things that you've asked for that haven't been granted somewhere, it says, sorry. And then there's a variant of it where you can come in with a mask that says, just give me everything I'm allowed to have, and you come out of it with uh, maximum allowed. So anyway, that's, that's the whole thing. It's kind of a complicated routine. I, I, I've wondered if for support purposes it might be useful for some Summer, some clever summer hire to like build a, a uh, an animation of it so you could see this is your access token, here is the routine comparing them and going through and coming up with a, an answer for you at the end to, to, to rub the nose of exactly why it came up with the answer that it did. <laughs> yeah, that, 
That's actually an interesting one. Yeah, a, a, a way to show you the effective, you know, the would-be granted access. Um, so anyway, that's the end of the intro. Check what I'm doing for time. Oh, well, I started at 40 past the hour. I'm, I'm 20 minutes in. All right, yeah, I'm a little over. Blame it on you still. <laughs> So some of the things that are specific in this, to an Exenta store here are, um, well, we can skip over some of this, but the SIS features you probably know about, uh, we like to brag about them. It, it is a very good implementation, particularly in the things that are hard, for example, that Samba is not doing today. Samba does a lot of things really well. You know, I don't bash them. It's a great implementation. But it's very, very hard for them to do multi-protocol file sharing. They're just SMB protocol. That's it. And so DFS contains, uh, data maps. That's right. So and we have that. That's right. It's a much much stronger model. That's, that's and Samba can do that now. There's actually a ZFS backend for Samba. It's still not as integrated as this. So we, we I'll leave it at that. Um, so cross-protocol coordination of locking and cache delegation and so forth is, is very hard to do without having at least some of your implementation down in the file system. So that's, that's where the sort of expensive work was done and what we're enjoying in this, you know, the fruits that we're enjoying in this implementation. So a little more, you know, relatively common stuff. We do the, you know, we store all, we're pretty faithful to the protocol of storing all the DOS attribute bits and extended you know, alternate streams or NT name streamed as they're, as they're called and things like case insensitive lookup that are also, you know, if your file system didn't, wasn't planned to support that, it's actually a little bit expensive to implement. So, so it's, it's a very good implementation in that regard and that's one of the reasons that we're continuing to invest in it and trying to bring it forward. It does have some flaws and, and we're working on these and, and we'd like to hear, you know, privately as we've had these talks out in the halls and so forth, uh, what's your favorite uh, feature that you'd like to see coming? My boss reminds me to say none of these are promises. Uh, <laughs> we are investing, but we, you know, I, I'm not allowed to promise schedule. Uh, but you know, we are working on these things and investing. So, and th this first one has come up a few times. People are surprised by it. I, kinda, I consider it a bug. Um, you really don't expect it to work this way. So you share a top level ZFS file system and on NFS you connect to various things underneath that you traverse into the data as you'd expect, but on SIFs you traverse into empty directories. People get annoyed at that. You wouldn't think it should work that way. It's easy enough to work around. You simply need to make SIF shares for each of the things that are actually file systems. It's just a little bit of an annoyance. So. No, those are, those are, it's, it's actually the ZFS mount points that, that cause you to traverse into an empty directory because it doesn't, for the SIFs protocol access, view of the file system is not going, it's not seeing the mount. It, it stays in the, in the parent file system. I guess the notion was what you shared is this file system, not this file system plus all of its children. So <laughs> it's a rather draconian view of things. <laughs> like I say, it's easy enough to work around, but yeah, it's something that should be fixed. Um, in the next census store, we have this cute anonymous access thing. It's, it's, it's really not anonymous access. It's more like guest mode, uh, where everybody comes in with a single account. Um, and it has a little more configurability than guest mode. Uh, I'll skip the rest of this. I think um, the intro covered it well enough. We, we are finding that the, uh, the d getting a machine set up in a domain is um, not as straightforward as, as it should be. That's one of the areas we're working on. So this is a slide is a little, just a little bit about what anonymous access is. We'll skip it. And work group mode, I think everybody I'm talking to here would know what that is. Um, the ID map restriction has been somewhat of a surprise for people. It, it does do its job and re relate uh, ephemeral UIDs and GIDs to security descriptors. It just can't do it with the fancy magic of going and looking up names in a domain because we don't have a DC to ask. We don't know anything about SIDS. The names, what names might be associated with SIDS, we don't know and don't have a way to find out in workgroup mode. 
And if you ask it to try, this is another bug, it will actually try in, in, in futile efforts and spew your log with complaints about how hard a time it's having <laughs> going and finding names. I can't find any names for any SIDs. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's actually fixed in later code that we're integrating, so. Um, so yeah, so in work group mode, obviously all your users and groups are local and the UI will let you uh, administer those. It's, 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 that's relatively straightforward. Um, so in domain mode, the, the things that are in Accenture store specific are that, so there are basically a few places where you need to get settings right. We probably need to work on our wizards or things like that to, to get this so that it's easier. Uh, so, but basically the things that people commonly get wrong are, um, well, and here's a, and this is one of the little bit of complication, we'll get to that. We don't use Kerberos for much, <laughs> but we do use it during the, because uh, it's not really a full Kerberos uh, AD domain member yet working on that, but it uses Kerberos for the AD account setup. It uses, it uses uh, authenticated LDAP to go set up the machine account during domain join. And then it basically doesn't use it for much. Uh, on, the, on the full Open Solaris version of this code, it uses it for uh, dynamic DNS updates and for publishing shares. And in the future, we probably should integrate that into the appliance. It's a useful feature. Uh, and that requires the, uh, the, the authenticated AD stuff, which uses Kerberos. Uh, but other than that, it's actually not used for much. It, you, you can kind of ignore it. Um, so in fact, I think if you go create your account ahead of time by hand, uh, you can s skip all of the uh, Kerberos stuff. So. Getting DNS configurations right is another one. You know, Microsoft sort of does this for you when you set up one of their machines on, uh, on these Unix derived machines. You've got to get the, the main name right and the search path right so that it can actually find your DCs correctly. Thankfully, it's not that hard to test if you get it wrong. This, this one area thing where our wizard really should have you enter DNS information and then actually verify that you can find a DC and then if it can't say, uh, are you sure that's what you want to be using? <laughs> it's just a common enough problem. And there are legacy reasons where we have it stored in more of one place. There's one place where DNS uses it to go decide lookups for general purposes in the system. There's another place that's specifically for, for AD use. Uh, it's a little silly. A NAS doesn't really need two places to store that information. We're working on that too. Uh, but if for now it's a gotcha. You need to know that there are two places that you need to check if, when you're setting that up. Um, and then uh, as far as our limitations, you know, trying to be full disclosure here, the, the uh, the outbound security code is, is a, a little bit out of date with regard to latest um, security protocol and policies for, for Windows machines. Uh, it, yeah. Well, how are your how are your other uh, servers working then? Because basically everything older than Windows, so you don't have anything older than Win 2008 in service. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm I'm hoping we'll have this uh, rectified soonish. So um, I'm not too concerned about that. This this has to do with the method of security we use when we go outbound, that's easier to fix. The, the security handling for, for full extended security protocols coming inbound is a little bit bigger project. We're going to need a little longer on that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we work fine with 2003. 